Hi, this is Tony Ruggiero, and you're listening to The Tour Coach. Look, these conversations that you're about to hear are all the conversations, the roundtable discussions, the lessons from my travels in teaching from whether it's in Mobile, Alabama, or to my home for instruction down at Old Palm Golf Club in Palm Beach Gardens. And these come from the team of experts and the team of people that I trust and that we work with day in, day out, week in, week out, whether it's on the PGA Tour, Live Tour, Corn Ferry Tour, or just where we're teaching. I hope you like what you listen to. We appreciate all the support, and I'm sure you've noticed we're putting out more and more content as the game of instruction has changed and more and more people want more access to more info, more content. We've decided to get with the program, and we've also I've made a concerted effort to really try to provide you what I believe is the best information and really good information and access to really good help for your game. So I hope you like listening to the tour coach and just like we did for Augusta folks from now through the end of the PGA championship, I'm going to give away a set of Shrix on irons, six dozen balls and six gloves to a lucky winner. We're going to also give away a vineyard vines prize pack as well as a Bushnell mini wingman. So three winners this time for our PGA championship giveaway. What do you have to do? You have to go to our YouTube channel. That's Do Sweeper TV, Do Sweeper TV, and watch some of the new Pro Work episode. Go on the Pro Work episode that has just been released. You'll see it right there. And comment, hashtag Pro Work, hashtag Do Sweeper TV, any of those in the comment section. Please share. Please like. We love doing this. We love growing the content. We hope you enjoy it. For a chance to win, set a Shrix on iron, six dozen balls, six dozen gloves, a Vineyard Vines prize pack, or a Bushnell mini wingman, go to YouTube, do Sweeper TV, find the new Pro Work episode, like it, share it, and comment hashtag Pro Work, hashtag do Sweeper TV. Any of those will get you entered, and we're going to draw the Monday after the PGA Championship. Hope you love uh, and enjoy this. Hope your game gets better. And don't forget, none of this would be possible without Mitch McConnell, McConnell Automotive, and Buick, GMC, Vineyard Vines, Bushnell, Shrixon Golf, and all of our family and friends. So enjoy the tour coach. Keep working at the game. It's the best out there. And we'll keep trying to bring you the best information. All right. So been wanting to do this one for a while. Parker, I, I think I tried a couple years ago and then we just got busy. But Jackson Court sitting with me and Parker McLaughlin, the short game chef. Uh, as he is commonly known. And I promise before this, there's going to be no arguing on the tour coach today. But uh, Parker, thanks for taking time. And I, and I want to start this off. You kind of touched about it uh, before we got going. You know, I came up under a bunch of great teachers and, and we had a way of teaching short game. But like, I always felt like that was kind of geared towards, you know, like it was super old school, which I like, but maybe for the not as good golfers. But for the most of the stuff that I've learned teaching short game and watching has been from being around guys like you, tour players, the best players in the game. And I think one of the cool things about what you do is you're, to me, you seem to take some of the nuances and the thoughts and the ideas from being a PGA Tour winner and a guy out there on the PGA Tour and are helping explain what the best players in the world do to get it up and down. And to me, it's, pretty, it's some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. Um, and, and I think you explained it pr pretty pretty spot on. I think that, you know, the whole mission statement of what, why I created, you know, Short Game Chef was, you know, I, I saw a lot of amateurs that were struggling with the short game. And they were taking, they were taking sort of thoughts of, of the past, which was, you know, I mean, you and I grew up with it. Like, we did. Hey, handle forward ball position back weight way forward and they were just thinking like this is how i play every short game shot and it's like oh, not really i mean there's some aspects of that that you may want to use on a certain shot but it's not every single shot and then people would start to um hit these really bad shots where it's a chunk <laughs> or a blade and then all of a sudden it's like boy it gets in your head and then you become a basket case um i think what what i liked about what you said was that yeah, I, I'm trying to take stuff of what I learn from tour players, the guys that I feel like are the best in the world at, at the different aspects of short game. So, like, I think I think Steve Stricker is and Jason Day are two of the best pitchers of the golf ball that I've ever seen in person, on video, and the stats prove it. 
Mm-hmm. So let me let me figure out what it is that they do, and let's and let's copy that because I think that's a fairly simple way for the amateur golfer to do it. Now, who do I think is the best out of the bunker? Do, 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 do those guys, do their ways, Jason Day, Steve Stricker, do they work the same out of the bunker or out of the rough? Probably not, right? So I want to, who can I copy out of the bunker, out of the rough? Well, Phil Mickelson looks like a pretty good guy. He, he hinges it, he releases it. Unbelievable bunker player. I've seen it with my own two eyes. We played at Pebble Beach together the first three days uh, at the AT&T Pebble Beach Pro Am, and the the sound that that his club made against the bunker on number two in that front bunker to a back right pin, we were both right in that bunker, and it was something that I had never heard in my life before. I was like, "This guy is different. He's doing something that I'm not doing." What can I learn? What can I learn? What can I take from Phil Mickelson? The guy's also finished second at the U.S. Open six times with rough that's usually about this thick, right? So obviously, that type of hinge and super steep delivery works out of that thick rough. So what, what can we take from all these different guys to, to sort of create, um, I like to compartmentalize the short game, right? I like to think that like pitch shot uh, is, is, is going to be a much different uh, sort of skill set than bunker shot, which is going to be a different skill set than, uh, you know, out of the rough or they're going to be similar. They're going to be some cousins, right? They're, the bump and run is sort of a cousin to the pitch shot. Um, which is, you know, and your bump and run is kind of a cousin to your putting stroke, right? So it's like, I like to sort of compartmentalize it in different ways. I don't think that there's like one size fits all. I think that you have to like adapt to each situation, to each lie. You've got to have a variety of tools in your bag. Um, and, and that's sort of where I like to, I like to take bits and pieces from old school and bits and pieces from new school, blend them together with what I feel like is sort of the best, you know, pun intended recipe, right? For each for each yeah. shot around the green. Let me ask you this. This is probably more for me, but like, would you say that pitching the ball is a cousin of your full swing for a lot of people? Because for I, a lot of people, it can be. Yes, absolutely. Because you know, especially like developing juniors, right? Like, uh, and good young players, you know, that that like high school junior golfers, beginning college. Like, to me, the art of pitching the ball, they're not very good at, right? They got one shot, one speed, and if it isn't that distance, they don't know what the hell to do, right? And But, like, I, I, I've had some decent luck helping young folks learn and improve their golf swing, but by doing slower motions, smaller shots, you know, like 30, 40, 50-yard shots. I was just curious more, what are your thoughts on that, and is that a valid – approach uh, yeah so yeah that's interesting i i really don't help anybody with their full swing so i'll leave that to you uh Good. much smarter than me uh, that but i will i will Better say i usually i usually start small and then work out okay right? so i'll start i'll start literally one step off the green with these people i might even start with a putter uh and i will and i'll build the foundation from there and i'll work out um <clears throat> but what i what i agree with you on is that as they're making this motion, they're making it, they're making these full motions, but they're, they're pivoting and they're turning. Correct. It's not, they're not just going like this, right. They're, they're using their body and they're turning. So in that, in that sort of fashion, yes, I would say that that those types of things are, are going to be somewhat of a cousin to, to our pitch shot motion, right. There's going to be some amount of pivot that's going to go into it where I see people get into trouble, especially you know, uh, higher handicap amateur golfers is they'll get five yards off the green. And it's just like, Oh, it's just a five yard shot. I'm not going to move anything except here and here. And it just, it never works out well. There's gotta be, there's gotta be that base of, of, right. of rotation and pivot and, and all the, all the greats that I've talked to. Right. I mean, I've, I got lucky enough to spend, you know, time over the last couple of years with Lee Trevino Whew. and I'm like five yard shot. 10 yard shot, 20 yard shot. What are you doing? He's like, Oh, I'm moving. I'm getting this left hip and I'm getting it out of the way. I was like, 15 yard shot. Yep. I'm getting it out of the way. I, I gotta move. I gotta move this body out of the way. I was like, man, if it's good enough for you, it's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great concept. I mean, uh, and I love watching old Trevino stuff. I think it's fascinating. Um, you know, and, and going back to what you said about Phil, work with Andy Ogletree who's out on live and he's playing on Phil's team. So 
you know, a couple of events, I got to walk nine holes. And I'm like, you'd be crazy not to pay attention to him watching his short game, you know? And that was kind of some of the stuff we started. Like, what he's doing is different than what I was taught to teach. And what he's doing is different than what a lot of people out there now are teaching people to do in the short game. I think it's a real value to watch what the best players in the world do and just try to figure it out. Yeah, Phil's, you know, he, he's – He's real creative. He has he has his own sort of philosophy on on how he sort of describes things. And I don't know, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know if he describes it precisely how he actually does it. Um, mm-hmm. So when he's thinking like, you know, I'm going to hinge it and then I'm going to hold. It's like, well, what he's actually doing is hinging it and then throwing it and then feeling like he's holding. Um, so, so, you know, and, you know, the other thing, too, is like not the like zero bad on, on Phil Mickelson because he's been nothing but great to me. Yeah. Um, but if you if you just go back and look at the stats on short game in the last 15 years, you know, Phil Phil kind of lives between 35th and 75th in strokes gain around the green. Right. He's not he's really not as, you know, I think I think all of us and even I, you know, I would be considered part of that. All of us fall for this this belief that Phil's got this unbelievable short game. Um because I've played with him, I've seen it up up close and in, in in person. Like some of the miracle shots that he hits over bunkers or over trees or, you know, out of the bunkers, whatever it might be, he hits these crazy get out of jail shots. Mm-hmm. But I think, but I don't think that he does the simple stuff like Jason Day and and Steve Stricker. I don't think he does the simple stuff quite that well. And so that that's where maybe his stats will lack. Where where, you know, I go back and look at at Steve Stricker's stats, and it's like. Dude, this guy's in the top 15 and strokes gain around the green like all the time. And he's finishing first. Jason Day, I mean, like these guys do the simple stuff really well. Their motion is conducive to uh to the simple stuff, to stacking the odds in their favor. Phil's motion is conducive to hitting the miracle shot and 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 pulling it off, but not necessarily conducive to hitting the simple stock standard shot quite as well, in my opinion. If you so question here, if you were coaching Phil, say Phil called you and said, Chef, I mean, what you know, I kind of heard your podcast. Um, I need to get better at the simple stuff, right? And I agree with you because I've watched it practice holes. And uh, I also think that's something that when we're gearing towards developing young players, is a lot of them focus on the flop over a bunker, an atomic flop or something, but then they get it 20 feet below the hole on the fairway and they hit it 12 feet, you know? And, uh, but like, what would you do? What would your approach be to Phil to make a guy like with a skill set like that to make him better at the, the, your bread and butter stuff? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that would be, that would be a crazy phone call to receive first of all. But I think that, uh, I think, you know, Phil's always, he's always on the extremes, right? You know, you, you watch some of his videos and it's like, well, the ball should, either be outside of your back foot or outside of your front foot. It's like, dude, that's that's on the extreme case on both, right? If you want to hit it extremely low or if you want to hit it extremely high, there's never, like, I get my players, I'm like, you should never be outside of your feet, right? The ball position should always be inside of your feet. Um, now, that's like, that's like the foundational piece of it, right? Like, you've got to start somewhere with some foundation. Like, there's no reason for that for that ball to sort of be outside of your front foot or outside of your back foot, unless you get in these extreme situations. Now, granted, Phil's playing at the highest level and he has for the last 30 years. And he finds himself at U S opens in some extreme situation where you may need ball outside of your back foot or ball outside of your front foot. I get that, but I would, I would get him back to a foundation of like, dude, show me, show me a little bit of like ball in between your feet shaft in a fairly neutral spot maybe leaning forward a little bit and show me what what you would do if i said phil let's just let's just not lean the shaft so far forward and let's not use our hands quite as much like what would it what would it look like for him and i bet he would pick it up so fast and he would all of a sudden be like huh this vanilla vanilla pitch shot seems to work pretty well yeah, um, vanilla is okay 90 percent of the time right yep Yep. And that, and that's one of the things like, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I started working with Keith Mitchell a couple of years ago mm-hmm. and 
he was one of those guys where he it was like great drive and and this is this is this will be a great story for you to kind of share with some of your high level juniors. Keith is a top ten driver of the golf ball on the planet, right? Now, his short game when we started was sort of around 190, 200 uh, on the PGA Tour. And when I asked him about it, I was like, well, you know, what, what is it that you are trying to accomplish with this short game shot? He said, well, this one I'm trying to hit like a little low cut spinner. This one I'm trying to hit like a medium trajectory draw pitch. And then this one I'm going to go high with it. This one I'm going to go really low with it. Okay, sounds good. Um, what are you doing with your driver? Like, what kind of a shot do you hit with your driver? He says, well, I hit a two-yard cut. Okay, dog leg left, winds, uh, winds, winds blowing uh, left to right. What are you doing? I'm hitting a two-yard cut. Okay, well, what if you got to go, like, over a tree and you're trying to cut the corner? I hit a two-yard cut. I said, what? Straight into the way what I hit a two-yard cut. I said, okay, are we starting to, like, starting to see something here? Like, you hit that, that's the best club in your bag. And you've got one shot with it and you trust it. And that's what you do every single time. So what if we bring some of that philosophy into the short game and now you hit a vanilla pitch is what I think Keith basically coined it, his vanilla pitch. He's like, he's hitting a vanilla pitch 85 to 90% of the time inside of 30, 30 to 40 yards. He's hitting a vanilla pitch shot. Um, and now he'll make tweaks to that where he'll open the face and he'll make a longer backswing and he'll throw the ball position back or he'll throw the ball position forward or he'll do something different with his release. But it's still what he feels like is the vanilla pitch, which is not some like crazy off my back foot or off way off my front foot, handle way forward, way backwards, whatever. It's still the vanilla pitch. And he's gone from, you know, 200. He, he sort of lives in sort of like between – 70th and 110th or 120th in strokes gain around the green. But that's sort of what he needs, right? He doesn't need to be a top 10 guy on the planet in strokes gain around the green. Right. He needs something that's just like, hey, I can trust this. And he'll have his weeks, right? Pebble Beach, uh, I think it was a year and a half ago, Pebble Beach. He finished like second in strokes gain around the green. Riviera, a couple weeks after that, he finished first in strokes gain around the green. He'll have his weeks where he'll like really shine stroke skiing around the green. But the point is he's developed a foundational piece where he feels like this is his vanilla pitch shot. And then he can get creative off of that based on the different shot shape type, whatever that he needs, but he's got a foundation built in there already. Uh, so let's go back to Stricker. I remember the first time I was, I was with Smiley and Beth Page once when they had the FedEx Cup up there, right? And I remember, and you know how they use those extra holes, the other golf courses, a short game area up there. And uh, I remember we Smiley was pitching and Stricker was standing there next to him. And I mean, I didn't see Smiley pitch for 30 minutes. He, he was like, finally, hey, how's that look? I was like, shit, I don't know. I'm sitting here watching this guy that every one of them's like this, right? You know? Uh, what what is it that makes him so good? What's his vanilla? What is it that what is it from from his technique that makes him so good? Um, man, that's a that's a great question. I think that for me, Stricker's about con controlling the spin. Right, it's not about maximum spin. It's okay. about controlling controlling the spin. And I think that he stacks the odds in his favor, so he creates a real wide arc. Right. Very, very minimal uh, wrist set. Right. So he, he almost gets the handle a little bit up at first and then he and then he sort of leaves it there. A lot of body and he just creates this huge wide bottom. Right. So he's able to hit the ball, hit the ground an inch before the golf ball, two inches before the golf ball and still hit a shot that comes out the same trajectory with the similar amount of spin. And so it's why he's. It's why he can he can hit hit one perfect. He can hit one an inch behind, hit one an, an two inches behind, and they're all going to end up in that like three foot circle. And you know, it's just uh, the he's he's able to manage his. I think he's able to manage his ball speed better than anybody else because he's not using these like small little muscles to like release it right at the end. 
he's using these bigger muscles to really manage manage his ball speed. I think that's why he's really good from 10 to 50 yards, like really, really, really world-class good. Like maybe best, maybe best ever to do it. Yeah. You know, I, one of the things I learned or not learned from him, but just watching. And I, and I love what you said is like when I'm developing young players or teaching, I always talk about controlling the distance with the size and the speed of their pivot of their turn. Right. And if, you know, and, and like, uh, and I don't really care like if they go nine o'clock or however they map it out, whatever fits their personality. Right. But like figure out where, like, you know, if I, if I, if I wind my rib cage back to this far and I go through that far at that speed, it goes X and start doing that. And that is kind of what I like to me, it was like, it just looked like it was the, with watching straight, it was the same damn thing every time, like, you know, and they came out, they reacted the same every time they hit the ground. It was, Blue, blue, right you know yep. but it, i love what you're saying about that i mean yeah it, 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 the idea of the wider arc because you see guys that to me there's people that are really good that get steeper but like to me the bad shots are worse the steeper you get is that a fair assessment and so i i don't think that anybody on planet earth will argue with you in that assessment <laughs> well now there'd be some people trust me. there might be somebody actually but um yeah. But yeah, I, I think that, you know, it, it's there, there's times, right, when when you have to, you know, pins in a, in a back corner and you've got to hit it over a bunker up onto this top ledge and you've got to put a bunch of spin on it to get it to stop. You're going to have to maybe take on a little bit more risk and, and build in a little steeper angle of attack to create the spin conditions that you want. Now, do, do I think that you can still stop it? Um, in that right in that proper area with uh, a little bit more height and spin absolutely um so i think that there's there's so many ways of doing it but i think at the end of the day you want to find a repeatable way number one you want to find something that is going to stack the odds in your favor you want to find something that is going to give you the freedom when you're at top of backswing, it's going to give you the freedom to feel like I can rotate on the way through as free and as fast as I want, and I'm not afraid of long. That's awesome. That's, right that's, that's, a super, that's a super freeing technique that I feel like not many people really talk about. They, they get to the top of backswing, and they're like, well, then you have to do X, Y, and Z on the way through. It's like, man, when I get my guys to top of backswing, they're like, all I, all I feel intuitively is that I just want to go. I just want to rotate. I don't think about a thing. And that, that's where I feel like, especially for, especially for the, the amateur golfer that plays once a week, once a month, whatever it might be, you got to get that guy to get to the top of the backswing and feel like, man, all I want to do is rotate and, and do it in the most free and athletic fashion. You get that player to the top of backswing and they've done X, Y, and Z to get there. Now all of a sudden they've got to do X, Y, and Z to get out of that. Boy, it's just a lot. It's a, it's a lot of coordinating and trying to stack things all in the right place to match it all up properly to then hit this one specific shot that may look cool to your friends, but the other nine you're going to get made fun of. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Uh, I mean – I love, I love that. What do you think about bunker? What's what from what you've seen the best bunker player? Because a lot of folks, you know, I mean, obviously not tour players, but recreational golfers. I mean, that's a place where to me it's one of the most vast differences between tour players. Tour players get in bunkers and they think they can make them. Recreational golfers get in them and they shit themselves, right? Like you know, they don't know what's coming. What 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 is the difference? Well, I think I mean you you I think you've seen it too in the in the last thirty years that just the entire philosophy on bunkers, uh, especially for the modern player, has really really shifted, right? You go from you go from thirty years ago, uh, maybe forty years ago, right? Like Tom Kite was sort of one of the first in like the late eighties, early nineties to bring out a sixty degree. So before that, it was fifty sixes, um, or even lower law, yeah. um, and those guys were all aiming left. Handle handle was higher and more forward. And it was like, hey, just swing along your feet line 
and hope that this thing deflects out towards the target, towards the hole. And and now, you know, tour players with, with the more law, with feeling like they're further away from it, aiming more square, and as they lower their hands and throw their hands further back, they're squaring the club face in that fashion, right? Without even, before even making a swing, they're already squaring up that club face just by sitting, lowering the hands, and shifting them further back. Now, at that point, you can just hinge it and release it down your target line without feeling like you got to go arms straight up, cut way mm-hmm. across it, and you can you can now swing swing down the target line. So the 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 modern player has really really shifted. I'd say I'd say ninety five percent of of tour players swing it that way. on On a very rare occasion, to a super short sided pin, they'll set up open and they'll try to cut the legs out from underneath it on the on the rare rare occasion but the stock standard bunker shots are much more uh much more from a square position yeah yeah one of the things i see uh you know it's like you'll see amateur golfers they come in and they get angles going every which way they get a face aimed way right they get a feet aimed way left shoulders you know probably square and then they can't figure out why they can't make the low point where they need to be or judge distance or spin right and I love that. Like I try to get everything a little more neutral, you know. And uh, um, anyways, and there's a lot of and there's a lot of matchups that you can that you can have with ball position and weight position. There's not, you know, there's there's some guys like a Kepka and a and a Luke Donald that get that weight position way forward, mm-hmm. and they match that up with a ball position that's way forward. Um, but they just sort of like they just get their centers all stacked on, on top of it. Um, and then, and then you, you'll get other guys that will be a little bit more, you know, kind of ball position slightly forward of center, uh, weight position maybe neutral to 55 or 60 percent with, with their weight on their front foot. Um, you know, there, there are different matchups to, with ball position and weight position and bunkers. Um, but I would say that, that almost every one of the guys these days is now has built in some type of hinge, some type of release. Um, there's very, I can't think of one that, that, you know, like Jason Day is a lot wider on the backswing, but he's still releasing it on the way through, right? There's still some hands on the way through. Um, but there's, there's, you know, you, you're definitely getting, you know, almost every single player is, is hinging it, releasing it. There's not a, there's not a ton of handle drag anymore. That's what I used to say. I mean, that's what we were taught, though, right? You know, going back to that old setup we talked about. I mean, totally. Yeah, you had to when you aimed that far left, <laughs> right? You had you had to dra- you had to drag it just to get that ball online. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, Jackson. You got anything? Come on, I've got a, I've got a bunch of questions. If that's all right. Yeah, a couple more. Have in your experience, have you noticed a difference between people who grew up on like with their short games? grew up on different grass or different environments. Like you get somebody in the desert compared to out West compared to up North compared to Bermuda. Do you see differences in their short games when they come to you without having a variety? Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and I think it's, it, it's partly generational too. Like I, I get okay. a lot of people, I get a lot of people that come to me. that are like, yo, I played division one college golf. I then started working, uh, had a family you know, fast forward 15 years, I'm starting to get back into golf again. Um, I'm hitting the ball fine, but my short, this, the same things I used to do with my short game back then, they don't work anymore. They, they, my short game sucks. I get a lot of that. Um, <clears throat> and so that was, that kind of goes back to sort of, you know, generationally what was being taught back then. As far as like actual grasses and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, I would definitely say that, you know, um, guys that grow up in, you know, let's say like sort of the Texas, Florida area, those guys have a, a more of a variety of shots. They're going to have to learn how to play that into the green Bermuda. Yeah. They're going to have to learn how to play out of, you know, sort of the real wet, you know, mm-hmm. like Texas winters, like mm-hmm. plus the real firm Texas summers, the hard right. bands there. They're going to have to play into the green Bermuda plus down green Bermuda where they don't need to be quite as sort of, um, you know, they don't need to be quite as ball first. Um, 
but yeah, it, it, it is, you know, I, I would say that I would, I would rather, I would rather a player sort of grow up in Texas and play all those shots. Mm -hmm. I do see some, like, you know, some of those bad habits. I mean, I grew up in Hawaii where it was like into the grain, wind, all that kind of stuff. And you're like, well, I just got way into like leading edge almost too much. Um, and if you, and if you're not taught a different way, you're just going to go leading edge for your whole career. And then it's tough to get out of. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that if you're playing on sort of like the overseeded ryegrass, um, I think it's much easier to play out of than the into the grain Bermuda. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but even, you know, if you grow up in a coastal place, like, you know, um, like on an Island, like the past palum is very prevalent on all these like Puerto Rico, Dominican, Hawaii, past palums everywhere. Um, and that's one where it sits, it sits up high. You can stay nice and shallow with it and it produces some great results. Um, Kikuya, you know, you get people that yeah. come, come from Kikuya. It's like, boy, if you get, if you get steep on that Kikuya, it'll eat your lunch yeah. right now. If you, if it's, kikuya that is let's say like rough kikuya you've got to get steep to get down and get in there um but like fairway kikuya i, I i've seen players that have much better success being shallower on fairway kikuya than than trying to be steep on that yeah and so when you are working with someone like my when i fall into short game stuff with Tony, a lot of times I ask them like, what are you working on in your full swing and how can we match that up? Kind of what you guys were talking about with the, the pitch motion and stuff like that. Do you see correlations when it's good that matches up with their full swing versus when they try to change a bunch of stuff to their short game to improve? Or, I mean, obviously with your skilled player, that's probably not an issue, but is, is there a complex between balancing their full swing stuff with short game changes as you try to develop them? Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 definitely always asking, especially if it's a really really good player. The the amateur player, not quite as much, um, okay. because it's just sort of like, hey, let's just build some fundamentals and whatnot. But with the really skilled player, I'm I'm definitely asking, like, you know, um, I would say college player and above. I'm asking, like, what are you working on on the full swing? Like, what, like, are these are these things? Um, creeping in from your full swing into your short game. Is that why we're seeing struggles or um, like, are you, are you working on whatever it might be certain pressure shifts, certain tilts, certain um, setting of the setting of the club. Are you working on those types of things in your backswing that are getting you in a weird spot for your short game? Um, you know, I mean, I, I think that like, you know, I mean, that that was probably like one of the things that I worried about with like what Victor Holland was doing last year was with his, with his chipping was I was worried about like, not, not worried, but it just sort of like, it, it was like, I wonder if what he's doing with his chipping is going to bleed into his full swing. Right. Which I, which I think it ultimately did. Um, and you know, that's sort of one of those things you just kind of have to pay attention to that because as a player starts to like really spend more and more time with whatever area of the game that they're working on, there's probably going to be some type of bleed over effect into uh, other parts, other aspects of their game. So it's, sure. you know, it's always great to sort of compartmentalize these types of things. Um, but yeah, th th there, there's always going to be some, it's always going to be a management of like, Hey, I'm working on this in my full swing but I don't want that to bleed over to my chipping or right. I'm working on this with my, you know, bunker game. I don't want it to bleed into my full swing. Right. Or my chip. Right. right. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. yeah. And I think that's how good teams function. If both, you know, with good players nowadays is like the swing, you know, whoever's doing full swing and short game, they got to talk back and forth from the player too. Everybody kind of works together to keep everything in line. Yeah. Yep. What's the best way to get people to bridge the gap from training around the greens and sharpening their, their tools to taking it to the golf course? Ooh, man, that's a great question. Um, you know, it, I think it's, it, 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 I think the answer to that question is a couple fold. Um, okay. Number one, I, I think that it's, it's how you practice. So like, it's going to be, it's, you know, I'm a big believer in like, okay, do your block practice, get things, Technique wise, like if you're working on changing something, get things technique wise in the right spot. 
Okay. So block practice is going to be important, but block practice is not going to help you on the golf course. It's just not. So block practice is just to get your technique in the right spot. Then it's time for you to start. Like once you feel like you've got that at the end of that session, all right, grab one ball, grab two balls, go play two ball, worst ball, nine holes. Um, and, and see if you can get it, get it up and down, you know, um, under like, let's say like two over par, if you're, if you're a decent player, two ball, worst ball for nine holes, mm-hmm. but that's going to be more in like play mode, right? You're going to have to go through and do that. do all that stuff. The third, the, the, the sort of the, the second part of that answer is you got to build a routine, right? If you can't take it from the practice area to the golf course, it's, it's strictly, it's strictly a routine thing, right? I mean, like routine is a massive, massive part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and everybody talks about routine when it comes to like putting and all that stuff. And I'm a massive believer in that, but it's not quite as much talked about when it comes to chipping. It's just sort of like, Oh, I'll just, you know, like when it feels right, then I'll like step in and I'll take a few looks and then I'll hit it. But if you've got some scar tissue or if you're not doing it properly, or if you've had some, hit some bad ones, you got to have a routine that you got to be able to fall back into and like trust that, okay, this is the routine that I trust. I know I'm going to take three rehearsal strokes and I'm going to feel it every single time. I'm going to feel the club on the ground. I'm going to feel the golf ball interacting with the club face. I'm going to see that. I'm going to picture that trajectory. I'm going to see it bouncing in my spot. I'm going to see it checking. I'm going to see it rolling to the hole, like get that deep into it. And then it's like, okay, then I'm going to step over it. Look back, go. Right. It's like you got to be able to be in a routine to get you out of left brain thinking and more into that right brain, uh, right brain, where it's more feeling, creativity, shapes, colors, all those types of things. That's visualization. Right. That's that's where that's where you should be living for those those short game shots. Love that. That's awesome. Parker, thanks so much. I know you've got more teaching to do today. Um Thanks for taking the time, one, to come on with us. And uh, definitely would love to connect with you and find a way to get you to come hang out with us for a couple of days. Oh, man, I'd love it. I'd love it. Um, yeah, man, definitely. Uh, for all your listeners out there, check out check out my website. I just relaunched it. It is, um, it's a great experience. It'll be it's called shortgamechef.com. It'll be, um, it'll be a mobile app within the next, like, 45 days. It'll be a, a TV, smart TV app. So you can put, put it in your simulator room in the next 45 to 60 days. So uh, definitely awesome. check that out. All my best top to bottom soup to nuts info is, is right there. We'll make sure we put a link to it on all the social pieces when we put this stuff out. This week. You're the best. I thanks, appreciate totally. it. Right. Hey, thanks so much for doing this. Let's, let's catch up soon. Absolutely. Love to. Thanks, right. Jack. Thank you. Right. Yes, thank you. Bye, guys.